Okay, hello again everybody. Um, let's just continue straight on with the reading. So we're now, uh, you should have a little 21 at the top right hand corner. We're pretty much halfway down that right hand side page, but as I reach this conclusion. So here we go. But as I reach this conclusion, I am amazed at how weak and prone to error my mind is. For although I am thinking about these matters within myself, silently and without speaking, nonetheless the actual words bring me up short. So essentially what it's saying here is this is very difficult to express. Um, this is kind of part of the reason why we now call this sort of stuff qualia. So we have a set word for what Descartes is discussing here. Um, he didn't. So uh, this is why it's so difficult to express. Um, and I am almost tricked by ordinary ways of talking. We say that we see the wax itself, if it is there before us, not that we judge it to be there from its colour or shape. And this might lead me to conclude, without more ado, that knowledge of the wax comes from what the eye sees, and not from the scrutiny of the mind alone. But then if I look out of the window and you see men crossing the square, as I just happen to have done, I normally say that I see the men themselves, just as I say that I see the wax. Yet do I see any more than hats and coats, which could conceal automations? Uh, so essentially what Descartes is saying here is that when we look around our world, it feels like when you know, we look out the window and we see people walking around, that our eyes are giving us that understanding that there are people walking around in front of us. Um, what he's pointing out is that all that your eyes see in this case are hats and coats. Um, so imagine looking down on people. All you'd see is their hat and their coat. Um, your mind kind of fills in the gaps and reveals to you, or kind of knits together the picture, we might say, and and presents it as people. Um, so he's sort of saying we jump quickly to conclusions uh, from our senses, but it's not actually our senses that tell us what's going on. It is our mind that knits together the picture. Uh, and, you know, he presents this as, I judge they are men. Now, the reason that judge is italicized is because judging someone is a thought. Uh, if you think of the properties of the mind that um, we talked about in the second section, um, well, judgment does not have, it's not a physical thing. It doesn't extend into the physical world. It doesn't have a smell or a taste. Um, so it is something that exists in the mind. And so he's saying that we judge our external world. In other words, we create our external world through thinking about it. It's not our senses that show us these things. It's our mind and the judgments of that mind that actually puts everything together. And so something which I thought I was seeing with my eyes is in fact grasped solely by the faculty of judgment, which is in my mind. However, one who wants to achieve knowledge above the ordinary level should feel ashamed at having taken ordinary ways of, to of talking as a basis for doubt. So let us proceed and consider on which occasion my perceptions of nature of the wax was more perfect and evident. So what he's done now is he's come to the conclusion that he uh, understands the wax through his mind, um, but that you know, if the wax exists, let's assume that the wax really does exist, that it's not a dream or something like that, that some information is being gathered from his senses, if they are real, assuming that they are real, but that his understanding comes from mental scrutiny. What he's saying now, or what he's about to go into is, well, which of these two is more trustworthy? Uh, the information coming from his senses or mental scrutiny? Pretty sure you can guess the conclusion he's going to come to from that. Uh, was it when I first looked at it and believed I knew it by my external senses, or at least by what they call the common sense, that is, the power of imagination? Or is my knowledge more perfect now, after more careful investigation of the nature of the wax, and of the means by which it is known? Any doubt of this issue would clearly be foolish, for what distinctness was there in my earlier perception? In other words, what clarity was there when he was thinking that his knowledge of the wax came from the senses? Remember, he pointed out that, well, every piece of sense data that we get about the wax changes. Its physical form changes, its smell, its taste, everything changes. So obviously we can't get much distinctness, much clarity from that. Um, was there anything in it which an animal could not possess? Um, so... Uh, 
what he's pointing out here, remember this idea that we are beyond basic animals, we're rational animals, again something that came up in the earlier part, um, but what he's saying is that, well, does he perceive the wax beyond just what an animal would? And he feels like he does, he has this understanding of what it is. Um, but when I distinguish the wax from its outward forms, that is its physical part, take the clothes off it, as it were, Descartes getting a little bit kinky with the wax here, uh, and consider it naked, then although my judgment may still contain errors, at least my perception now requires a human mind. So when we strip the wax down of all of its physical properties, what we are left with are some very basic concepts, and all of those basic concepts exist in the mind. They're no longer um, coming to us via any physical sense, okay? Um, so they now require the human mind. Uh, but what am I to say about this mind, or about myself? So far, remember, I am not admitting that there is anything else in me except a mind. Um, sorry, I should have uh, precluded this um, paragraph a little bit. Descartes going to start dipping his toe into suggesting that the physical world may exist again. Um, uh, and what we're going to see him present here is that um, he may exist in two ways. One way is absolutely certain. He exists as a mind. But he may exist as a physical body as well. So this is where the real dualist argument begins to be introduced. Um, uh, what he's going to say is, well, which of these is better known? And his conclusion is going to be that he uh, exists primarily um, as a mind. He's, he better knows his mind than he knows his body. Um, so let's continue. <clears throat> when I ask, is this I which seems to perceive the wax so distinctly? Uh, sorry, what I ask, is this I which uh, seems to perceive the wax so distinctly? Surely my awareness of our own self is not merely much truer or much certain than my aw awareness of the wax, but also much more distinct and evident. For if I judge that the wax exists from the fact that I see it, clearly this same fact entails much more ev evidently that I myself also exist. So essentially what he's saying is if we work on the assumption that wax exists because we can see it, well, I see myself much more clearly than I see a ball of wax. And if you think about your understanding of your physical form, you understand your physical self better than any other physical form. So maybe it does exist. Um, Uh, so, uh, it is possible that what I see is not really wax. It is possible that I do not even have eyes with which to see anything. But when I see, or think I see, I am not here distinguishing uh, the two. It is simply not possible that I who... Sorry. Uh, it is simply not possible that I who am now thinking am not something. <coughs> Excuse me. Um... So what he's pointing out here is, well, even if it's a dream, even if the wax doesn't exist, again, the fact that he is perceiving wax, the fact that he's thinking about it, means that there must be something that is thinking. Thought is an action. There must be an actor to perform that action. Um, by the same token, if I judge that the wax exists from the fact that I touch it, the same result follows, namely, that I exist. If I judge that it exists from the fact that I imagine it, or for any other reason, exactly the same thing follows, and the result that I have grasped in this case of the wax may be applied to everything else located outside me. Um, so he's now sort of jumping to allowing the existence of the entire physical world by saying that, uh, well, if I can perceive it, it must be there. Um, maybe not in reality, it might not be true, but there must be something there. Um, even if it is just my mental scrutiny creating it, um, it must be there, even as an illusion. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and the result that I've grasped in this case of the wax may be applied to everything located outside myself. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, moreover, if my perception of the wax seemed more distinct after it was established not just by sight or touch, but by, my, but by many other considerations, it must be admitted that I now know myself even more distinctly. In other words, if he thought he knew wax, he must know himself with even greater certainty. This is because every consideration whatsoever which contributes to my perception of the wax, or of any other body, can but cannot but establish even more effectively 
uh, the nature of my own mind. So essentially he's saying that, well, if I can know wax, I must be able to know my body. Um, again, remember, this is not our primary existence. We primarily exist as a mind, but that mind is creating a sensation of a body. Uh, this is like a secondary level of existence. But because, uh, sorry, but besides this, there is so much else in the mind itself which can serve to make my knowledge of it more distinct that it scarcely seems worth going through the contributions made by considering bodily things. I, I see that without any effort I have now finally got back to where I wanted. I now know that even bodies are not strictly perceived by the senses or the faculty of imagination, but by the intellect alone, and that the perception, this perception sorry, derives not from their being touched or seen, but from their being understood. Uh, so key, key point here. Um, we have knowledge from understanding, which is derived from mental scrutiny, from thinking. Uh, and in view of this, I know plainly that I can achieve an easier and more evident perception of my own mind than of anything else. But since the habit of holding on to old opinions cannot be set aside so quickly, I should like to stop here and meditate for some time on this new knowledge I have gained, so as to fix it more deeply in my memory. So, that takes us to the end of the second meditation. It gets a little bit confusing towards the end there. So, what are the key points? Firstly, that the mind is better known than the body, as physical things can change, but the mental understanding of them don't. For example, wax. This is very similar to Plato's argument of the forms. You have an understanding of the idea or the notion of wax. But when I ask you what that wax is, the only way that your language allows you to express it is through physical properties. So it is hard. But then if I turn it into a liquid, you would say, well, that's still the wax. If I was to say to you, but it's not hard anymore, you would just respond with, well, wax isn't always hard. So you see, we're limited by language um, and we're also limited by the fact that uh, our understanding of things doesn't come from the physical world, but when we try to explain them, we always put it into physical examples um, or physical properties is probably a better way to put it. So what does this mean for Descartes himself? Um, if wax can exist in sort of two ways, the idea of wax and then the physical wax that he's actually holding in his hand, assuming that it is really there. This means that for Descartes, his primary existence is not in the form of a physical body, as this changes. Uh, so, for example, if he goes and get, gets a haircut, which he certainly needs to do, um, this uh, he still understands that he is himself. He still has a notion of himself. But if he can change uh, physically and still be the same thing, then what is him must not change. And so he must exist primarily as a mind. That is our first form of existence, as a mind. Uh, and from that, knowledge does not come from the senses, nor from the imagination, but rather from mental scrutiny, from thought, the action of the mind. So, where to now? Um, read the criticism of the thinking thing argument, sorry, that should be the wax argument, uh, in your textbook. Um, so that's page 60 to 67. Uh, make sure you understand how Descartes progresses from one point to the next to finally make the argument that he exists as a mind which is better known than the body. Remember, the body may still be an illusion. What is not an illusion is the mind, because even if what he is thinking is false, that he is thinking is not false. Uh, and we've now reached the end of the second meditation. Um, so work on your summary notes and decide, do you agree with uh, Descartes? that we primarily exist as a mind, that that is our first form of existence. That when I think about the notion of me, it is actually as a non-physical mind. Uh, and do you agree that this reveals truth or understanding to us, and this can only happen through mental scrutiny? Um, we'll leave it there, and remember, we've just got one paragraph of uh, the sixth meditation to go now. So I'll speak to you next time. Bye.